By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we have a nice Tron battle for you. So this is a battle of the Tron lands. Here you can see them on your screen. I have loved these lands from the start. When I was 11 and I saw them for the first time, it was one of the reasons that I wanted to start collecting antiquities, my favorite set of magic. So um, today I am playing with the Tron uh, deck, but also my opponent Bjorn is playing with the Tron deck because whenever I hear someone playing with Tron, I want to see what's up and I want to play against them and preferably with my own Tron Brew. And this time I'm playing with my deck Dwarven Workshop. We've seen it on the channel once before. It is uh, red and artifacts and I'm taking on Bjorn's Brew, which is uh, Tron Bowl. So he's playing white and red and artifacts, of course, and, uh, and Tron. So I'm looking forward to kind of show these decks to you. Now, before I start with the deck deck, I would just like to point out that as always, you can also skip that part of the video. You can go to the games straight away. I know some of you enjoy doing that. The easiest way to do that is by checking the description below because there you will find some timestamps. One of those timestamps reads MTG Games. Click on there and that will take you straight to the action in the description below. You can also find more information about the rule set and you can find a super nice link to the Timmy Talks Patreon page. Uh, and that is of course a way to support the content that I make. So if you like Timmy Talks, if you like the channel, please consider becoming a patron and visit patreon.com slash Timmy Talks to have a look. It already starts with just $1 a month and with that little uh, support, you're really helping me keep the channel alive and, and help me expand the channel and continue making these videos for you. Okay, now that that is out of the way, I would like to start with the deck deck section of the video and I'm gonna start with Tron Bowl by Bjorn. Let's have a look. And here we see the deck of Bjorn Tron Bowl. So the first thing I notice here are a lot of fireballs, a lot of disintegrate, so the X spells, right? And of course the Candelabra of Tannis and the Mana Flare. So it's a little bit Candle Flare integrated in this deck as well. And of course the Tron Lands, right? So what happens with these Tron Lands is if you've got them all combined, so an Urza's Power Plant, uh, Urza's Mine and an Urza's Tower on the table, they don't tap for just one mana anymore. No, the Power Plant and the Mine tap for two and the uh, uh, Tower taps for three. So that means with just those three lands together, you already have seven mana. Now, what are you gonna do with all that mana? Well, a well-known strategy, of course, is put it in a huge fireball because the fireball is an X spell, right? So this is a pretty common strategy. Now, if you combine this with the Candelabra of Tannis, you can start making mana. Candelabra of Tannis is this really easy, funny artifact, one to cast, tap and pay X, where X is the amount of lands that you wanna untap. So for example, if you've got these three Tron lands, you tap them all, you've got seven mana, use three of those mana in your Candelabra of Tannis to untap your lands again. That means you, you net four extra mana. So now you've got 11 mana instead of just a seven mana. So this of course really good and it gets even better if you've got a Mana Flare on board, Mana Flare and Enchantment from red, one red and two to cast that says if you tap, uh, your lands for mana, it produces an additional one. So that means that all of a sudden, for example, your volcanic island doesn't just produce one blue, it can now produce two blue when you tap it. Now, of course, this again works together really well with the Candelabra of Tannis. And when you've got Candelabra of Tannis, uh, the, the Tron combination and Mana Flare on the table, boy, you've got a ton of mana. And what are you gonna do with that mana? You're gonna kill your opponent with a huge fireball or a huge disintegrate. And then there's even a fork in here. If you don't have enough mana, you can fork that huge fireball and deal even more damage, right? So that is basically the core of the deck. That is how the deck wants to win games. Now, if we look at the rest of the deck, I notice that there are no creatures in here. It is completely creatureless. And um, Bjorn has chosen for some weapons against like early creature pressure, because I do think that's of course um, I wouldn't say a weakness of the deck, but that's a danger, you know, when he's, he has to play against these, for example, green aggro decks or white weenie decks, uh, just these very aggressive decks. Then he has uh, three uh, uh, lightning bolts, of course, in the deck, three swords to plowshares in the deck. He also has a maze of if in the deck, and he plays with two cards that I really like seeing, and that is Desert. Desert is super cool. It's a card from Arabian Nights, a land. You can tap it for one mana, but you can also tap it to deal one damage to an attacking creature after it's dealt its damage. But I mean, that is just super sweet, right? You can use this to kill an Argovian Pixies, 
kill a savannah lions. Like there are quite a few creatures that you can stop. You know, there, there are more and more aggro strategies out there. And with desert, you kind of put a stop to that. So it's a really nice way to kind of, you know, get rid of that early pressure, survive that early pressure, because this is really a deck that you want to take into the mid game, late game. We also see two modes in the deck, which I think is quite good. Two white and two for an enchantment that says that you cannot be attacked by non-flying creatures. And um, I, I think that it's interesting that he's chosen mode because a card with the same casting cost that I think would work really well in this deck as well is Wrath of God. However, I do think it's quite interesting because, you know, Moat is an enchantment, um, so it stays. Wrath of God is just one effect for one turn. Yes, it kills all the creatures, but after that, your opponent can build up again. And it is not very good against Mistress Factories. So I kind of get the Moat, but perhaps I would put, put Moats in the main and maybe Wrath of Gods in the sideboard for when you're playing against an, an opponent that, for example, is also playing with white and has weapons against moat, or when you're playing against an opponent that's playing with a lot of flying creatures, then you can always kind of swap those two out. Uh, another card that I find really interesting in here and good in here is the card Mirror Universe. Mirror Universe, six to cast, and during your upkeep, you can sack the Mirror Universe and you can trade lives with your opponent. So this deck is quite slow, right? So perhaps early in the game, you're gonna take a lot of damage. Mirror Universe puts you in a spot where that doesn't matter. You know, if you're on, let's say, 8 or something, your opponent is still on 20, you can simply swap, and then your opponent's on 8, and he's also easier to kill with your Fireball or your Disintegrate. So I think two Mirror Universes are really, really good in this deck. Obviously, it's also a wise decision to put GM Day Tomes in here, because if you're going to have a lot of mana, what are you going to do with all that mana? If you don't have a Fireball, you can put, use them to draw extra cards uh, with your GM Day Tome and trying to find that fireball that you need to kind of finish the job. Then we also see a blue splash here for the power cards, Time Walk and Ancestral Recall. Perhaps I would have also added a Time Twister in this deck. The reason for that is that once you have a lot of mana going with this deck, all you need to find is, uh, is that one fireball or disintegrate. And with a Time Twister, you only have to spend three mana of all the mana that you then probably have with Candelabra of Tondas and Mana Flare. And then you get to pick up seven new cards and maybe you'll find, you know, that game decisive fireball and win the game. So I think maybe a, a, a time twister could be interesting here. Of course, there are always a lot of interesting cards you can put in a deck. The big question is, what are you going to take out? I have no idea. But, but time twister for me would be a consideration and Wrath of God would be a consideration. Perhaps what I said in the sideboard to swap them out for the modes because mode can be really good against some decks, but against other decks, it's not so great. Okay, this is the deck of Bjorn. Now let's take a look at my deck, Dwarven Workshop. And here we see my deck, Dwarven Workshop. Now this deck kind of started with me wanting to use Dwarven Weaponsmith in a deck. I think the art of this card is epic. One red and one to cast. You can tap it during your upkeep to second artifact and put a plus one plus one counter on any creature and i just really love this idea of for example taking one of those moxen in this deck or taking the candelabra of tonis and putting it in the furnace and making a weapon out of it i, I think flavor wise it's just super cool and what you can do with that plus one plus one counter because it's quite a unique ability that the dwarven weaponsmith has you can put it on for example your tetravis and then you can make an extra tetravite a one one flyer or you can put it on your trike and you can have an extra plus one plus one counter you can take off the trike you're basically giving the trike an extra arm how cool is that not having a four four trike but a five five trike or a six six trike it is super cool now of course with all these counter creatures, um, it is really good to have um, a, a Taunus's Coffin in the deck. That's the card I'm thinking about. So Taunus's Coffin, four to cast, three and tap, put target creature in the coffin. It's out of the game. You can untap the coffin in or keep it tapped. When you untap it during your untap step, the creature comes back into play tapped, but all the ETB triggers uh, trigger again. So the enter the battlefield triggers, they trigger. So that means that when I put my Taunus, my trike in my Taunus's Coffin, I untap my coffin, the trike comes back in the battlefield with an additional three counters. So now it's not just a 4-4, no, it's a 7-7 seven, seven with six plus one plus one counters. So that, of course, is kind of insane. So there are a lot of ways in this deck where I'm trying to give my, uh, my creatures extra counters, making them extra big, and by making them bigger, I'm also making them more dangerous. Then we also see the Tron combination with the Candelabra of Tanis, which is something that Bjorn is doing as well. So I'm again trying to accu accumulate as much mana as I possibly can with the Candelabra of Tanis and the Tron Lands. Um, and then, of course, I'm playing with a Fireball and a Disintegrate as well. So that is also part of my plan. I'm also playing with a Mana Flare. So from that perspective, which is quite funny, 
uh, uh, Bjorn and myself are kind of trying to do the same, but Bjorn is a little bit more committed to the candelabra of uh, Taunus, Tron, Mana Flare deck because he's playing two candelabras and two Mana Flares, where I'm only playing one Mana Flare and one candelabra of Taunus. So I'm not, it's not my main strategy, but it is a strategy in the deck. So I, I think that's the biggest difference because my main strategy, of course, is trying to control the game and play out those big robot creatures like the Tetravis, like the Trike, like the Clockwork Avian, you know, and, and that way win the game. And I'm also playing, because I just had to, I'm also playing with my one unlimited Sheevan Dragon. I own one unlimited Sheevan Dragon and it is this crown jewel that whenever I build a red deck, I, I need to find a place for it. I have to put it in. I don't always do it because it's double red, so it could be quite hard to cast, but I want to put it in there. Talking about the double red, that is actually, for me, what's what's holding it back a little bit because it's harder than you think to get double red with this deck, even though I'm only playing red and artifacts. I have a total of eight red sources, I believe. Yeah, eight red sources if I count the Mox Ruby. And that makes it pretty tough to cast anything with double red and casting cost, but I am playing two Blood Moon main. So I think that those Blood Moons can in some situations also help me where I will play the Blood Moon, not necessarily to turn off my opponent's lands, which would be great if they do, but also to kind of help me get that one red mana that maybe I need to start casting the Sheevan Dragon. Um, anyway, this is my deck. We've looked at the deck of Bjorn, so let's go to the match. Game number one, here we go. Bjorn on the play here, starting with a Volcanic Island. And there's a Mox Sapphire as well and a pass turn. So uh, that's a pretty good start from my opponent. Now, I'm also playing with all the Moxen in my deck, so hopefully I can have an uh, equally explosive start, at least finding a Mox. Drawing a card there. And it looks like I've got an Urtz's Mind there. Chatting away a little bit, but I'm sure I'm going to have a turn one play, right? Going to go through my hand right now. He already kept it, by the way. Starting with an Urtz's Mind. And just a pass, though. No Mox, no nothing. There is an Urza's power plant and a pass. So we're seeing some Urza lands, which is quite nice. Let's see what I can find. I've got a Chaos Orb in hand there. So I'm playing an Urza's tower. Okay, so I need a power plant now, and then I can have my Tron lands active, tapping two here. Gonna cast a Chaos Orb and a pass turn. So I'm kind of giving my opponent a chance here to play, for example, a Shatter on my Chaos Orb. And there we see a Pleto tapping, and there's a Disenchant, so not a Shatter, but a Disenchant, of course. He's playing with white. Doesn't play with Shatters. But uh, that Disenchant now on the Chaos Orb, so the Chaos Orb's gone. Playing a Mountain. And actually, a, uh, a Blood Moon could be quite good here. Not playing it out, just passing the turn, because it could cancel the white mana and... Uh, well, he does have a Mox Sapphire, so Blood Moon wouldn't actually be that good. There we see an uh, Urza's Mine on the side of Bjorn. Is he going to play out anything? No, no Book, for example, just a pass. And we're both having quite a slow start. My deck can be quite explosive early game if he can find the Moxen. But I'm not finding them. There is a Strip Mine. So that's not ideal because now, of course, he can strip one of my Tron lands at the moment uh, that I get Tron. Okay, there's another mountain, so no Tron for me. And uh, it looks like I'm just going to pass. So no Clockwork Avian, for example. That card is 5 to cast for a 4-4 four, four Flyer. Unfortunately for me, I don't have it in hand, it seems. And just passing to turn over here to Bjorn, I believe. So Bjorn drawing his card for turn. Playing out another land. There was a little glitch around the video. Can, cannot see what land. I think it's another Urza's Mind. That's why he's put it on top of the other. I'm also playing another Urza's Mind. This is the thing that happens a lot when you play Tron. Ooh, there's my first kind of big threat playing a Tetravus. So that is a 4-4 four, four Flyer. And those uh, three counters on there I can take off to make 1-1 one, one little Tetravites. And there is a Time Walk on the side of Bjorn. I wonder what else he can do with this turn. Perhaps he can also play out, for example, a Jam Day Tome. Playing a land for turn, tapping four. 
there's a moat. Okay, that moat's not going to affect the board much because I have a flying creature. I wonder if you can find a swords or perhaps a disenchant to take care of the Tetravis. I think, yeah, tapping two is there. Disenchant a balance. Okay, that's also, that's also a way to get there, I guess. So in this case, balance kills my creature. Let's take a look at our hands and our lands. I've got six lands. I believe Bjorn's got maybe one more. Yeah, Bjorn has seven lands. So Bjorn has to put one away and I have to discard quite a lot of cards actually. That's pretty bad. Throwing away a mana flare. And uh, yeah, my mana flare is pretty beat up. That's probably why I'm showing it here to Bjorn. Anyway, throwing away my mana flare. Again, a little hiccup here on the camera. And only two cards left. Pretty good play from Bjorn. He's getting rid of a creature. He forces me to discard three cards and he only loses one land. So that that is really good news. There is a Maze of If by Bjorn. And I do play with Icy Manipulators, which I really like as a weapon against Maze of If. Tapping six again. What am I going to cast? Casting a Triskelion. But of course, my Tri cannot attack because of the moat. And I'm playing another mine. So I've got three Urza's Mine. I need a power plant to get Tron going, although I don't think I really need Tron at this point, unless of course I've got a burn spell in hand. Tapping five. Okay, there's a Clockwork Avian. So now I need to find something to tap the Maze of If or get rid of the Maze of If. I think earlier in the game, playing out that Chaos Orb so early was a mistake. I should have kept it in hand, I think. I know why I did it. My, my reasoning was, you know, if Bjorn has a weapon against it, he's going to play out some artifact removal, which is fine because I've got so many artifacts. So I'm just going to play another threat. Playing a factory, both of us just top decking at the moment. That mode is, is controlling the board completely. Tapping four. Are we going to see a gem de tome? Yep, there's a gem de tome. That's something you can get, kind of wait for, right? Okay, there's a quick shatter and he's going to draw one card from it. And passing the turn back to me. Again, a little glitch on the cam here. But I'm playing a Jam Day Tome as well. With that workshop, it's quite easy to cast. And if he disenchants it, at least I can take a card out of it. Just like Bjorn uh, did with his own Jam Day Tome when I put his Shatter on it. There is a Mishra's Tower. He now has Tron, by the way. That is kind of scary because remember, he plays with a lot of burn in his deck. There's a disenchant going to use the book in response, of course, of course, just like Bjorn did. So we're both kind of getting a card out of our Jam Day Tomes. That's fair. I still need to find a way to deal with or the moat. Finding another one. That is very, very lucky. Ancestral Recall here by Bjorn. Oh. And I just have to find an Icy Manipulator with my Gem Day Tome to start tapping down the Maze of If, so at that at least I can attack with my 4-4 Flyer, because I kind of feel like I'm playing on Borrowed Time, because Bjorn has got so much land now that he's got Tron active, and remember, he's playing 3 Fireball, 2 Disintegrate, so that's 5 X spells in total. And uh, I mean, I think, I think he's got more than enough mana to deal 20 points of damage. Playing a Bolt here on the life total of Bjorn, kind of understanding there's need for speed from my side, putting him on 17. Tapping four, gonna draw a card. Okay, have I found an Icy Manipulator? Looks like I found an Icy, so now I can tap down the Maze of If and attack. I believe that's something that I'm gonna do right now. Tapping down the Maze, gonna swing in. Oh, there's a Swords to Plowshares though. That is unfortunate. I mean, I'm gonna take some life, but who cares? That is very unfortunate. I was hoping to kind of start dealing damage and then perhaps finishing it off with a Fireball or Disintegrate. Tapping one red, playing another Bolt. So more damage here for Bjorn, gonna drop to 14. Remember, Bjorn is also playing with two Mirror Universes. So if he can find a Mirror Universe, he can play that out, start switching our life totals. I've got that Trike as well on board, of course. That's good for three more points of damage. I can put him on 11. Tapping six. Oh, Mirror Universe. This is a huge problem for me. I need a Shatter against this Mirror Universe. Okay, there, there we go. We got a little snack break. <laughs> and we're back. Oh, that's funny. Those things are, are bitter ballin. It's uh if you ever if you ever go to to a pub in uh 
in Amsterdam or the Netherlands, just order bitterballen. It's really quite tasty. They're hot though inside, so be, be careful. Just take a little bite. Don't put the whole thing in your mouth in one go. But um, yeah, this, this, this mirror universe is really, really, really problematic for me. This is a big problem. So I'm, I'm untapping, taking my turn. Oh, while eating a bitter ball at the same time, by the way. But taking my turn, trying to find a solution here. Actually, this is really good. Tannis' coffin, it's going to allow me to put the trike in the coffin and, and, and kill Bjorn. The problem here for me is that Bjorn is on 14. I cannot kill him yet. Even if I have burn in hand, I don't have enough to kill him. Because I can deal... 7 points of damage plus strike, 10 points of damage. I can put him on 4, so that's not enough. And I know that he's going to change life totals next turn. So I, I'm, I'm stuck here. I'm stuck here. Yep, there you go. He's going to use the mirror. He's going to swap life. This is horrible. This is just horrible. I'm on 14, and now he's on 24. This is so bad. This is. I was so close to victory. Does he have a fireball now? Is he just going to burn me out? I just have this feeling. I mean, 24 was a bit of a stretch for him, but now that I'm on 14, he's got 14. Remember, he's got Tron. Okay, he's going to tap three. Mana Flare, making it even worse. Okay, now if he's got that X spell, I'm dead. He's got two cards on board. Does he have the Fireball? Then I'm dead. Showing what I have. Oh, look at what I have. I could have... Oh, I just needed two more turns. Oh, and if he wouldn't have been able to swap the lives with the Mirror Universe, I would have won this game one. Oh, this is frustrating. This is frustrating. Okay, well, anyway, it's what is it's it's what our decks want to do. I'm not surprised by this ending. And 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 Bjorn simply has five more outs. I've got two outs that way, you know, with with a fireball and a disintegrate, and Bjorn's got more. And I mean that mirror universe play was really, really well played. So uh, I guess we're gonna shuffle up again and then uh yeah, we're gonna give it another go in game number two. Game number two, here we go. Bjorn on the right, I'm on the left. I'm on the play, I assume, after losing that first game, starting with a mountain and a pass turn. So, I mean, what I'm kind of hoping for, because when I look at the two decks, um, you know, Bjorn, obviously, his deck is catered more towards just building a huge fireball. My deck is a bit more creature heavy, so hopefully I can play creatures early in the game, like this Dwarven Weaponsmith, put a little bit of pressure on the life total of Bjorn. Um, j just go a little bit faster than than um, than in game one because I am playing, of course, with all the Moxen and playing with Soul Ring, so I should be able to kind of ramp up a little bit. So playing out an Urza's Power Plant, of course, an early Tron would be quite nice. There's a Lightning Bolt on my Dwarven Warriors. Playing out a Mox Ruby and playing out a Soul Ring. Okay, here we go. Now I'm ramping up and playing out. Not a creature threat, but this is also annoying for my opponent, an Icy. And of course, I'm starting to tap down his lands in his upkeep. So this is this is pretty nice. Problem is I only have two cards in hand, but still. Here we see some ramping by uh, Bjorn with a Mox Sapphire. So um, yeah, it's it's interesting. I think I think with that with the Icy I can be very uh, very annoying for Bjorn. And I can cut him off from his white man. I can tap down that plateau during his uh, his upkeep. So that's quite nice. Let's see what else I can do. Tapping four here. Yep, tapping four. Another ice manipulator. Ooh, this is going to be super annoying for Bjorn. I'm going to tap down both of his dual lands, of course. So hopefully I can I can stretch the game a little longer. I can find one of my creatures here to start putting some pressure on the life total of Bjorn. Finding a mountain. Sheevan would be so sweet right now, but I'm not finding it. Only playing, of course, with one Sheevan. Untapping, drawing again. What can I do here? Playing out another power plant, so I don't have Tron. Only one card in hand. Gem Tome would be really nice for me as well. Bjorn not doing too much, so he is giving me the space. But now my deck has to deliver, of course. Tapping six. Are we going to see a trike? There's a Triskelion. Four, four. That is pretty good news. I'm going to pass the turn. I'm actually going to tap down his plateau and both of his plateaus now, I think. Trying to cut him down from uh, from white mana. Oh, I guess I'm not. Okay, just tapping down the uh, volcanic and the plateau. I think it probably was better to tap down the two plateaus, cutting him from the white sources because white gives him access to disenchanted swords. 
Attacking here for four, putting him on 16. Mana Flare on the table. There's a book. Okay, this is great for me. And I think I'm still on 20, so I don't think he's got enough mana to burn me out next turn. So putting him on 16. The Gem Day Tome is really going to help me potentially be a game changer here. And uh, passing the turn. So now let's see what I'm going to tap down. I think I should tap down both of the plateaus. And obviously if, if, if you're an... Oh, it looks like I'm going to do more. Tapping four. There is a bolt and a wheel of fortune. Wow. And my hand's empty. This is ideal. Wow, I thought I was passing the turn. But no, I was not. I was playing a bolt and then playing the wheel. Remember that Mana Flare gives me access to a lot of mana. Look what he's discarding there. That was a mirror universe. That was a disintegrate, a fireball, and I think a fork. So this is fantastic. Such a good wheel of fortune from my part. Of course, the wheel kind of was a no-brainer because I had no more cards in hand except for the wheel of fortune and, and Bjorn still having four or five cards in hand. It was the perfect moment to actually cast the wheel of fortune. Seems to be a little glitch on board here. We see Bjorn taking his turn. So I'm tapping down his white sources here. But in response, of course, Bjorn can still play instances. Going to play a disenchant on the trike. Going to use three points of damage from the trike to uh, to take Bjorn's life total down with three points there. It's going to drop to ten. There we see a Urza's power plant. So he's got three towers and a power plant. But both of us have like tons of mana right now. But I think that Book could potentially grant me the victory. He's on ten. If I have a burn spell, I can burn him out here. There we see a Winter Factory. Gonna draw an extra card, trying to find burn or another creature threat. I'm still on 20, so he cannot burn me out, I think, next turn. Tapping 6. Okay, there we're gonna see a trike, another creature on board. And even if he destroys the trike, I can still hit him for 3 with it, so that he's gonna go down to 7. I'm gonna pass the turn, gonna tap down the plateaus again. There we see a bolt. I'm going to drop to 17. What is he going to do? There's a maze. That's actually pretty good. He's going to pass the turn. Okay, I, of course I can tap the maze down and I can still attack him. Use my icy tap down the maze. Attack for 4. Put him on 6. I can also attack with... Oh, I can actually hit him for 5 because I also have the winter factory. I can hit him for 5, gonna put on 5, can I then kill him? I can take off the 3 counters. Okay, I can attack, it's a 4-4, four, four. oh, I can actually deal 7 damage, I can win this one. All I have to do, exactly, I'm gonna attack, I'm gonna pump it with the factory. Gonna deal 7 points of damage, he'll be on 3, then I can take the counters off, I can win the game. Am I gonna win here, game number 2? Yes, I'm gonna win game number 2, I'm happy because we're gonna see game number 3. Look at that, there was a fireball in hand on the side of Bjorn, but it just wasn't enough. I was still too high. I think key in this match was that Wheel of Fortune taking care of Bjorn's Mirror Universe. Mirror Universe, super, super risky for me. So um, this was game number two, and I'm happy it's 1-1 because that means we're gonna go to game number three. Game number three, here we go. So it's 1-1, Bjorn's on the play. This is the decisive game. Who's gonna win this matchup to Tron Wars? And uh, let me know if you like Tron decks, by the way, in the comments. Have you ever tried to brew something with Tron? If so, let me know what color you decided to play. I always find it quite, quite difficult with Tron, the mana base, right? Because 12 lands are taken by colorless mana. What are you going to do with the rest of the mana base? And therefore, I usually choose to play with one color besides it, two colors max. Uh, but I also like to see Bjorn's version here, where he just goes for three colors. And he's really using the Tron to kind of support his, um, his mana strategy. So just... Basically, build a huge fireball, and with Tron, it goes extra fast. Anyway, I'm playing out a, uh, a Mishra's factory here, it seems, or is it still Bjorn's turn? Not quite sure at the moment. Yep, it's, uh, it's my turn. The question is, am I going to attack with the factory? I'm probably not, because there's, there's just a lot of risk that it gets destroyed. Okay, tapping four instead, what am I going to play out here? There's an Icy Manipulator again. I mean, these ICs are great. And there is a desert. 
on the side of Bjorn. So Desert is, is, is usually good, but I think in this matchup it's not very useful for him. At least it still gives him a mana, so it's not too bad. But I don't have any one toughness creatures in this deck. Well, that's not true. I've got the Dwarven Weaponsmith, but yeah, I, I can live with the fact that the Dwarven Weaponsmith cannot attack. Anyway, playing a Clockwork Avian. The Clockwork Avian is actually a 4-4. Uh, a four four. It comes into play with 4 plus 1 plus 0 counters. It's an 0-4 creature by itself. And every time you attack after the attack step, you got to take one of those counters off. And then during your upkeep, you can uh, rewind it by putting new counters on it, but then it taps itself. And uh, we were kind of discussing the Clockwork Avian, and I think it's, it's Bjorn said th the card would probably be more balanced if it would just be a 4-4 flyer for 4, with, of course, the downside that you take those counters off after attacking. I kind of agree with you, Bjorn. I think uh, that would have been good for the Clockwork Avian. We would have seen it a little bit more on the tables. Attacking here, but there is a quick Swords to Plowshares, though. Yeah, Swords is so... Whenever you play against White, you remembered how good White removal is. Disenchant, Swords to Plowshares, they're just so good. And uh, tapping four here, going to play a Gem Day Tome. So this is quite nice, right? On, on one hand, yes, my creature threat is gone. But he's first taking care of the creature threat, and then I play out the Gem Day Tome, right? Because I think the Gem Day Tome is more valuable for me because it's going to get me new creatures. There we see an Ancestral Recall. Talking about value, one blue for three cards. That card is insane, instant speed. It's so overpowered, and, and but you know it. When you play old school, it is a broken format, and sometimes you're going to find broken cards. That's part of the fun, actually, of playing old school. And, of course, Ancestral Recall is a beautiful, iconic card. Tapping four to draw a card. I think I've got enough mana now to just start attacking. Exactly. And also my philosophy is if he has any more creature removal or, you know, artifact removal, let him spend it on my factories so that he cannot spend it on, you know, my Icy Manipulator or Gem Day Tome or other creatures that I'm going to play out later that are just bigger and, and beefier. I mean, I, I guess if he, if, he puts, if he puts a Lightning Bolt on my factory, that would be pretty bummed. I would be pretty bummed, I mean. And he's playing out a Maze of If right now. So Maze of If, again, I can kind of tap it down with my Icy. Ooh, Mirror Universe! It's so annoying. It is so, so annoying. I mean, the good thing is I'm... I'm Bjorn's still on 18, so even if he changes, um, you know, if he changes life totals, it's not the end of the world. Shatter! Oh, this is great! Shattering down! That mirror universe, that is fantastic. Finding a shatter with the Jam Day Tome. So that Jam Day Tome is just key in this matchup. I just hope that Bjorn cannot find a Jam Day Tome. Because with the Tome, you get to draw cards. When you get to draw cards, you get to find the answers. You get to find the threats that are going to lead you to the victory. Now, remember, Bjorn does have two Mirror Universes. Okay, there we see a Mana Flare first. I mean, I love the fact that Bjorn is thinking, you know what? This is my strategy. I'm just going to pl uh, play out my Mana Flare. I'm not going to hold back. This is what I want to do with my deck. And I think that's good. Playing a Mox Jet, so I can now just tap two lands to draw a card with the Gem Day Tome because of the Mana Flare on the table. And uh, I wonder if I'm also going to attack here. So drawing a card, I'm probably also going to attack with my Factories, of course, first trying to see what I can find. Can I perhaps find another threat on the table? I think I can. Tapping six. There's a Tetravus. So now I can still attack for one with the Factory if I want to. Can use my Jet or my Emerald to animate the Factory and attack. Okay, actually changing my mind. Changing the mana a little bit. Bjorn was quite nice to allow me to do it. And uh, I also want to play a Bolt, it seems. Just put ultimate pressure on the life total of Bjorn. Because, I mean, if you're playing against a deck, these type of decks, there's one thing you're always worried about, and that is a huge fireball, right? So I have to try to play as aggro as possible with this deck. I'm really, I'm really the, the aggro player here because I'm, I'm the one playing with creatures and Bjorn is really the player that's going to respond to the creature threats in this matchup. So game number three, all deciding match. I'm on 24, Bjorn's on 13. I wonder what he can do here. He's got tons of mana. Uh, let's count. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. 16 mana. I mean, if he's got a fork, can he make it? Does he have a fork? Oh, that would be killer. The way he's putting his lance together, I'm getting really worried. I feel like he's got a fork or something. Okay, so there's a big disintegrate. Uh, 
Um, does he have a fork? If you have a fork, he wins it. Does he have a fork? He is counting again. Oh, there's the fork! And a lightning bolt. I was already dead. He didn't even need the bolt, I think. But, oh, this is such a killer. And look at that eye that disintegrate. I would have won the next turn. These games are so close. Well done, Bjorn. Oh, man. That is crazy, crazy, crazy. If he wouldn't have had that one fork, I would have won the match. Oh, man. I was so close. I could smell the victory. Anyway, congratulations, Bjorn. And uh, thank you for bringing your deck to the table. You told me you uh, uh, tried out this deck in the... Uh, uh, online Dutch old school league the Odol and uh, that you actually did quite well that you made it into the top eight So that is that is really good I think I think your deck is quite strong and you're probably right by when you're playing Tron just to go for the X uh, fireball uh, Strategy, I think it's quite good. You can also combine it really well with um, the uh, the rocket launcher That's also a card you can use that I find quite interesting in these type of decks uh, as well Anyway, thank you Bjorn for uh, for bringing your deck to the table and showing it here on Timmy Talks And also thank you for watching another episode right here on Timmy Talks the channel where we talk old school magic and if you enjoy what you've seen, please consider becoming a Patreon. Check out patreon.com slash timmytalks for all the ins and outs. It already starts with $1 a month and there are some perks attached. One of those perks is uh, that you can uh, become a member of the Timmy Talks Discord. So there you can chat with all the other patrons and also your name will be mentioned in the end scroll at the end of every video. What end scroll? This end scroll. Ik het als fikkertje somber gezien.